Last Learning by Nancy Schaefer. Mom, you say, can't you just let go? And you do not mean anything small like an argument or an old hope or the sheet edge she is holding, but also all of these because she is dying. Yeah, yeah, she says flicking your words into all the sky between Florida and California, one of you at each end. You ask because of the terrible reason she is lucid today, unending pain. She has climbed out of chasm after chasm of medication to report this, is frantically caught between a body far too ill with cancer ever possibly to recover, and a lonely learning at the last minute how to relinquish what remains. She would choose neither. Because she still can speak, you hear in her very own words, formed and not this most anguished of suffering. Mom, you say, loving her so much you suggest her dying, Can't you just let go? And all the sky between you, you wait, engaging that nothing, both possible and everything. Cradle her with your voice. Tell your love, which cannot end. She was an activist true through and through. All throughout her long, long life, decade after decade after decade, she had worked passionately and diligently for organizations working for social justice, working to make a difference in the world. Her life had been filled up with serving on boards, attending meetings, joining political campaigns, working on behalf of candidates, organizing for or against pieces of legislation, marching at demonstrations, attending rallies, showing up with signs at protests, and all those other activities a person does whose passion is helping to move the world in the direction of justice. And then for her, there was an invitation to come to Washington, D.C. for a major march for women's rights. And she didn't go. The trip was just too physically demanding. All that time on the uncomfortable bus, too many hours in the heat marching too many miles for her feet to carry her, her physical limitations, which she was beginning to feel, made her feel unsafe in going. Over the next several years, as I knew her, she'd lose first the ability to drive at night, which made it so much harder to get to those community meetings. And then she'd have to give up driving entirely. Her friends offered to take her, but she didn't want to feel like a burden. When the weather was particularly nice, someone would pick her up and take her to the weekly peace vigil and even bring a lawn chair for her to sit in on the side, the corner of the road. But the days when she felt well enough to go became fewer and fewer. And when I'd visit her, the conversation would inevitably come around to her own sadness about these limitations and her sadness to miss out on all the activities those limitations foreclosed. How I wish I could have gone to that march in D.C., she said. I can't get to those meetings anymore. And then, I'm pretty useless these days. And now my life isn't worth very much. These phrases are painful. They're expressions of pain, anguish, desolation, sorrow. And I promise you, I'm not being overly dramatic here. 
I heard those exact words. Now my life isn't worth very much. I'm worthless now that I can't do the things I used to do. This sermon is really my attempt at a response or my, my fumbling with a response of what, of what do I do when someone tells me that they're not worth much anymore. As a minister, I hear these words most often from individuals who are crossing a threshold in the aging process that brings them face to face with limitations. But not exclusively. I've heard these kinds of existential questions. What is the point of my existing? What good am I? From people who are struggling with debilitating illness, including mental illnesses such as depression. And I've even heard uh, these statements from people whose lives are tied up with being caregivers, whether that is uh, for small children or, or older children or aging relatives. And this, I, I thought at first, is somewhat ironic because, because day in and day out, if you're involved in caregiving, isn't the importance of what you do kind of right there in front of you? But I've encountered parents of young children or, or people occupied with caring for relatives who are filled with a sense of longing for their lives to have an impact beyond where it does. Guilt that they are not able to put more of their energies in other directions. And it occurs to me that what I am describing, the the people I am describing, are valuing their own lives in terms of what they are able to do. They're valuing their own lives in terms of what they are able to do. My life is made worthy by my doing. Have you ever thought that? Have you ever thought that way? I have. And it turns out that this way of thinking is actually amplified within our Unitarian Universalist tradition. Um, Many, many UU congregations begin every worship service by reciting a spoken affirmation. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament. And service is its prayer. We don't say those words, but, but I think it's telling that, that so many UU congregations do. I remember a story I was told about a group from a UU church who went out to do a day of service work in the community. They were with service groups from various faith communities around the town, um, and the organizer directing this interfaith day of service invited the UUs if they would like to say a prayer before the day of service. One of the UUs scoffed and said, service is our prayer. Let's get to work. Pick up that shovel. There is a problem. There's nothing wrong with service. But there's a problem with making service a religious sacrament. If you say service is our prayer, does that mean that those who are unable to serve are also unable to pray. Our hymnal, it turns out, is full of affirmations of people who put feet on their faith, as it were. A favorite responsive reading, I've had us read it at least once, is by Marge Piercy. It's her poem entitled, To Be of Use. I want to work with people who submerge in the task who go into the fields to harvest and work in a row and pass the bags along, who stand in the line and haul in their places, who are not parlor generals or field deserters, but move in a common rhythm when the food must come in or the fire be put out. Or another reading from our hymnal, which we do each spring when we recognize congregational volunteers. It's a reading that recasts the Beatitudes that Jesus spoke as praise for church volunteers. We read read those words last spring. Blessed are those 
who, when asked to serve, do it gladly, who do the work of committees and stay till the end. I think it's a pretty telling rewrite to take Jesus' Beatitudes, blessed are the poor, the meek, the hungry, those who mourn, and to replace them with blessed are board members and committee chairs and, and committee attenders. Blessed are they indeed, but it's, it's, a very interesting, it's a very interesting kind of UU rewrite. In the Unitarian Universalist rewrite of the Beatitudes, blessing comes from doing. And of the actual passages from the Bible that are found in the back of our hymnal and suggested for congregational use, we should not be surprised that not one but two readings come from one of the more obscure epistles, the epistle of James. James is a favorite text for Unitarian Universalists because it contains exhortations to work. And so we find in the back of our hymnal, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I by my works will show you by my faith. Or these words of suggested benediction, be doers of the word not merely hearers, doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. Doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. I'm just saying that it's telling that that words like these are what we find in our hymnal and not, say, Jesus' instructions in Luke to consider the lilies of the field, how they neither toil nor spin. In the realm of theology, this harkens back to the classic kind of Christian theological debate between salvation by works and salvation by faith. Those who favor a system of salvation by works believe that what saves us is our ability to do certain things, to perform certain acts. And those who favor a system of salvation by faith believe that what saves us is grace or an inner faith and that our salvation is not dependent on our actions. And here, for a a kind of a humanist translation, um, oftentimes the word salvation doesn't mean sort of transportation to an afterlife. It means actually kind of we're saved by what creates the, the, what is it, you know, the the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of heaven here on earth. So is is it works? What saves us, what creates the kingdom of heaven is the performing of certain acts, or is what saves us that kind of inner faith. Critics of works point out that an overemphasis on work leads to self-righteousness and pride to the idea that, that we can save ourselves. And critics of salvation by faith say that this is far too passive. They would say that faith needs to be expressed through works for it to have any meaning, like James said. So this is all some fairly dualistic, all-or-nothing thinking. But in Unitarian Universalism, as evidenced by Marge Piercy, by the rewritten Beatitudes, by the multiple quotations from the Epistle of James, there is a thread of works righteousness to us. I see some of you nodding. That's not surprising. Service is our prayer. Or... In the words of dozens of doers feeling the effects of age or of a decline in their abilities, I'm not worth anything anymore. I'm not worth anything anymore now that I can't do the works I used to be able to do. What worth am I? But while there is a thread of our theology that insists that our worth is tied to our ability to do, there's another thread of our theology that insists that this is not the case. One thread declares we are worthy in our doing. Another thread insists that we are worthy in our being. Consider the seven principles. The first of these seven principles assert that every single person has inherent worth and dignity. Every single person has inherent 
worth and dignity. Is this true? Do you, do you believe that this is the case? It's actually a challenging idea, and we're used to thinking that this poses a challenge to us about loving our enemies, loving those people who do things that are harmful to the world. If every single person has inherent worth and dignity, does that mean that the violent criminal has worth, that the bigot has dignity, the politician in Raleigh has worth and dignity, (laughs) that the political candidate on the debate stage has inherent worth and dignity? Does, does Donald Trump have inherent worth and dignity? Does Hillary Clinton? You know, uh, We're used to thinking that the first principle is challenging. You're looking at some of your, your Facebook posts. I see that some of us don't believe that, that these politicians have worth and dignity. <laughs> but we're used, to, we're used to thinking that the first principle is challenging because it forces us to deal with the idea that a person we can't stand has worth and dignity. Not potential worth, but inherent worth. But maybe this principle is also challenging because it suggests that the person who has reduced ability to act, to do, also has worth. Not a worth that adheres to a person on account of past good deeds. Not a worth that is dependent on a potential for future good deeds but inherent worth in the here and now. How many of us struggle to imagine that this is the case, that we are worthy in our being? What makes us worthy is not what we do. We're not worthy because of our potential to do things in the future. We're not worthy on account of the things we did in the past. We are worthy in our being simply because we are. Is this idea difficult? to anyone difficult to accept? So I was talking with, with some people um, here, in, here in the church and, and beyond kind of about this, this idea of what it means to say, you know, we're, we're worthy in our being. And, and, I, and I phrased this question of, of well, what do we do? What do we do when we're not able to do what we used to do? Um, and, and it was that, I, I said it that way, and it was very interesting that the responses I got were from people who said, okay, if you, if you can't do what you used to do, you can do something else. And they pointed out this, there's, there's always something else that you can do. Um, someone said it's like, it's like baseball. It's like the power pitcher who throws a 100-mile-an-hour fastball uh, begins to, in, in his 30s, feel the effect of age, the wear and tear, and those miles per hour start coming off the fastball, and that pitcher has to learn how to get by with, with off-speed braking stuff and painting the corners and, and veteran savviness. And I was like, yeah, but what, but what, what about when that goes? Or in basketball, the, the high-flying dunker, hits age 30, which is like over the hill for basketball. His knees and his back get creaky, and he loses a spring in his step, and driving dunks turn into fadeaway jumpers. Like, yeah, but that's, you know, eventually those, those jumpers will be harder to hit as well. Or one person gave to me the example of the artist Henry Matisse, Matisse, one of the the great painters of the the 20th century, developed a cancer of the abdomen, had surgery, and the surgery, the effects of the surgery was that he was left uh, bedridden and unable to paint. And it was then that, that Henry Matisse picked up scissors and took to cutting and arranging paper cutouts, creating art evocative of the human spirit, creating art that is maybe even more, more moving than his fine painting. And yet the, the problem is that eventually, eventually even the scissors will need to be put down. The problem with saying, well, you can't do that anymore, but you can do this, is that it is a temporary respite 
all doing will cease eventually. For the readings today, I selected two symmetrical poems, um, two real, real heart poems. In first lesson by Philip Booth, a parent is giving a daughter swimming lessons, and the lesson is not to do. Lie back, lie still, and the sea will hold you. Daughter, believe me, when you tire on the long thrash to your island, lie up and survive. In the devastating last learning by Nancy Schaefer, a daughter speaks to her mother as she is in the process of dying from cancer. And all the sky between you, you wait, engaging that nothing, both possible and everything. Both poems are about a spirituality of being, are about a spirituality of just being after doing. And so when I was asked by that activist true through and through, what am I worth now? I struggled with that answer. I still struggle with that answer, but I'm convinced that the answer lies in having a theology of worth in our being, over and above, not instead of, but over and beyond a sense of worth in our doing. Struggle to communicate how it is that we can be have a sense that we are inherently worthy in our being, irrespective of our doing. I don't know if this is an idea that you've ever struggled with or if you've ever known somebody to struggle with this. And I invite you to take the, the work of the, the sermon and, and make it your own. Challenge you to end the, the coming days, coming weeks, really look, where is, it, where is it that you ascribe yourself as having worth by virtue of what you are able to do? And do you also, what would it be like to ascribe your worth worthy, as Billy Joel said, just the way you are, to find worth in your being? It's a hard change of thought but it's important and it's a challenge that I extend over to you. Amen. Blessed be. And thank you for your generous listening. Our